Mind and Linux Part 2. Alright, <coughs> welcome back. So, uh, I had some technical issues which consumed a lot of time in my last presentation. I didn't get to show all the demos. Uh, and also, one of my desires for that presentation, hold on a second, for the feedback, was to demonstrate the details of the configuration of ALSA and ALSA audio. And unfortunately, I didn't have time to figure out how to do it that time. So I decided I would add that to the beginning of the second part to, of the talk. Um, it's still frustrating the hell out of me. Uh, I was able to get a couple of uh, things to work, um, which I will demonstrate. And so what should have accomplished what my original goal was. Um, but the thing about audio and Linux is it does basically just work now. Um, all the audio devices and all the laptops and almost all the sound cards are all identical. Um, and uh, the hardware is supported by the Linux drivers. The card will figure out from the PCI ID um, of the card what it is, load the appropriate software, and most of the rest of the hardware is just the analog side, which decides how good of quality the sound actually is. Um, but all of the primary devices are supported. So it usually just works when you plug it in. But there is a lot of complaints when you have multiple sound cards in a the computer. They get numbered um, automatically. And people don't, aren't always happy with what's chosen as a default. So there are ways to configure also to specify specifically what card you want to use. And it does depend a lot on the software, too. I'm going to show a little bit with the uh, um, with the command line, uh, uh, also player tools, how you can specify which sound card you want uh, to play stuff out of. What I wanted to demonstrate was how to tell also to play the same audio stream out of all of your sound cards. Because it is possible, but I was not going to be able to figure out how to get it to work. Um, so I'll go over what should have worked in the configuration. And there is something about it that is not working. So I'll do a quick review um, of uh, the way it also works. It'll be very quick because I did spend quite a bit of time on that last time. And there we go. So the sound card itself is represented in the, uh, in the dev directory tree. Um, those entries are created by uh, uh, dev and now I don't know what system the other fact that apparently it deals with all that now. Um, but uh, what appears in the dev tree is these devices here. Uh, PCM, pulse code modulation, card zero, device zero, playback. Um, the next one, the last C stands for capture. So PCM is the type of device. It takes a digital screen and sends it to a digital audio converter, which gets out a waveform, which just sounds like what it's supposed to sound like. Um, Capture is the reverse, where a signal appears at the end of an analog to digital converter and a stream of uh, bits comes out of it, which is a digital representation of that audio stream. Uh, the control on the hardware uh, devices um, are the way that the, the operating system communicates with the card to configure things like bit rate, um, uh, privilege sample frequency, um, uh, and uh, various other control structures. Uh, none of which I've heard any of the documentation on. And the MIDI device, which is a part of, of many uh, sound cards, MIDI is not actually an audio device, but it's used, it was a standard device for interconnected musical instruments. So it is very much interrelated with audio. Um, so not all the cards have all the devices, but um, also actually provides an abstraction for all of this to make it a little bit more um, uh, reasonable to, uh, to deal with. In here. So, in addition to the dev tree uh, in the proc file system, it creates a bunch of directories. At the top, there will see card 0, card 1, and card 2. This is from my computer at home. Uh, card 0 is, um, if you look a little bit further down, there's three links which point to card 0, 1, and 2 HDMI generic and S4A. Um, the first sound card enumerated in my computer is the audio link that's part of the HDMI standard, where the television itself actually is the sound card, and there's just a, uh, a stream of audio data going from the video card system to the TV, and the TV produces all of the sound. 
Um, the second one is uh, the label is generic um, by the, by its own driver. But what that is that was the uh, the built-in audio on my motherboard, which is a very very expensive uh, AMD based uh, uh, AM1 based motherboard, cheapest thing I could buy uh, at the time. And the last one is a slightly more complicated device that's got all these fancy lights on it here. It is a DJ controller um, that has a built-in four-channel audio device in it. Um, it's, uh, um, it is essentially two devices plugged into one USB port. Uh, it is a four-channel audio controller and it's a MIDI controller that um, each one of those buttons produces the same MIDI signals that you get when you press keys on the keyboard and the software is configured to receive those and respond as a play button or as a stop button. Um, I'll demonstrate that a little bit later on. Um, and then there's some other stuff in here. Um, actually, I don't know. So... This is a file in the profile system that tells me all of the currently configured uh, devices that also knows about. Um, in this system, I have the internal um, uh, audio of the laptop and the DJ, I mean, DJ controller. This laptop does not have HDMI. So these are the two devices that I'm dealing with for this particular presentation. They've been enumerated automatically, um, in this case in a very same way. The uh, built-in audio gets, is the first device, and the um, and the S four A is the second device. In uh, also configuration files, um, each device, um, which is each card, has put the potential of having more than one device on it. Um, and a certain, some sound cards have a di an analog sound output and a digital sound output. The digital output is actually assigned a separate device ID. Um, but for in most configurations, the, the basic sound device that gets configured by also will have the name HW colon 0 comma 0. Uh, if there's a second device on the same card, then it would be 0 comma 1. And the first device on the second card is enumerated um, we'll have one point one comma zero. Um, it specifically uses the terminology card, even though some of them are external devices plugged in by USB. Um, so the, the that and it's confusing because that would be more considered a device than a card, but device is something that's already being used. Um, so the uh, in the configuration file, which I'll show you in a moment, the one that I was working on, um, uh, you specify potentially all of these parameters to, uh, um, to configure the device. Uh, only the first two are required. Um, the type HW meaning that it is a actual hardware device. Um, so it's basically just a point on the, on the kernel driver that, uh, that provides communication. Um, and the device number, or so the card number, which in most cases you can specify either a number like zero or one, or that string that was in the uh, in the card list is actually provided by the driver, um, and it could be used instead. In theory, um, the uh, uh, that was part of the problem I think I was having um, before. Um, but uh, so um, the other uh, parameters here, the uh, uh, the device number. Um, usually starts at zero, but if you wanted to specify like the digital audio output of your sound card, you can specify the, the uh, device. Certain ones will have will be, will be programmed with sub devices. I've, I've not encountered any devices that do that, but it did potentially can, it, can it treat each channel of the sound card like a separate device. Um, these other ones are fairly technical. Um, the uh, uh, Non-blocking open mode, I believe, is uh, uh, allows certain devices that can do audio mixing can actually receive multiple streams simultaneously and do the mixing in hardware. Um, not all sound cards can do that, and also provides a software mixing front end uh, called DMix. 
um, which is one of the things that you can get around to uh, the end of this talk. Um, uh, the format, there's a digital sample uh, format, is usually um, 16 bits of data, um, which is almost as much as the human ear can distinguish. Once you get it past 20 to 21 bits, the human ear cannot possibly distinguish that kind of resolution. Um, but 16 is definitely not enough, um, which uh, is the reason why people think vinyl sounds better than CDs. Uh, one of the reasons is that the, the human ear is capable of distinguishing a little bit more um, uh, resolution than the CD format was originally designed to do. Um, the other reason the human ear doesn't, uh, doesn't like CDs as much as records is the sample rate, which is the number of snapshots of the waveform. Um, the, uh, the digital information produces a series of dots, which if you draw them out, would redraw the waveform. Um, with, if you don't have enough dots, you're going to only have an approximation of the waveform. Um, at 44,100 samples per second, at 16-bit resolution, you get a reasonably accurate representation of the waveform. Uh, high frequency sounds will be missed by that because if the, if the transition happens in between two samples, then it's completely missed. Um, and it is, um, if the, uh, and it is basically just guessing or averaging out or rounding off all of the samples, which is the reason why it's not perfect. Um, modern digital audio standards that are included with Blu-ray discs and uh, more advanced uh, digital audio actually uh, can deal with all of that and actually can produce far more resolution than the human ear can actually hear. Um, so in that case, most of the time people are just, um, who think that vinyl is better is just because they like the sound more. Um, uh, and uh, channel maps um, is another thing which I was hoping to be able to demonstrate. Um, what you can do is, if you have a multi-channel sound card, like a, a 5.1 array, you have a left and a right, a center channel, a rear left and a rear right, and uh, what's called the LFE, um, which is like a subwoofer, but it's even lower than that. It would be the sounds that you don't hear, but you feel. So if you're watching a movie that's in surround sound, there will be certain times when there'll be an explosion on screen and you actually feel it with the proper sound system in the movie theater because there are actually frequencies that are actually below what most people can hear, but it's loud enough that you can feel it. And that information is encoded in the surround sound screen in the LFB channel. There's also a standard for 7.1, which provides side speakers as well as the rear ones. And one of the things about the surround sound encoding if it's done properly. You can fake surround sound. There are ways to calculate. You have a left and a right. You can add them together to get the center channel. And then in the rear channels, what they provide is some combination of the mono mix of the two and the difference between the two. The uh, left channel subtracted from the right channel on one side and the right channel subtracted from the left channel on the other. Um, it approximates the, um, the effect of surround sound. Um, but in a properly mixed surround mix, what they can actually do is if on the screen you have a character who is right in front of the camera talking, their voice will just come from the center speaker. Um, if a car drives across the street from left to right, the sound will transition through those speakers and they, it's, something, it's supposed to be coming from behind the viewer, then it will actually come through your channels. Um, down mixing that um, is uh, not just a simple, you can just have the left and the right, but then you're actually going to miss the dialogue which is the pain in the center. So I went over in one of the configurations, which I wasn't able to get working, but I can show you in the configuration how it works. And um, the hardware device that's created has one serious limitation is that. The hardware has a limited number of settings that it can handle. It will be configured to handle a certain range of uh, sample rates at uh, a certain uh, bit resolution. Um, and if the screen that's being sent to it is incompatible, it will just return an error. So there is something called a plug plugin. It gets really confusing because then there's a hardware plug plugin that's separate from the plug plugin, which is on, attached to the hardware. 
it, it's my memory. But what this does is it takes a stream of any input characteristics. It could be any bit rate, it could be any sample um, uh, frequency, um, and it will on the fly convert it. Um, and you, so you specify um, it's a it's creating a new device. Um, but I call it internal. Um, so PCM uh, internal is creating a device which is a type plug which slaves to the uh, existing PCM for the primary uh, uh, audio interface in the uh, computer. Um, so now um, it, it can be addressed by me in, in, the, uh, in the configuration which I'm going to demonstrate in a moment. And that is the last slide that I have chance to create. So what I'm going to do is uh, um, Sound RC is one of two places that you can you can put custom configurations for also. Um, the way it works is um, every time a device accesses also, there are three configuration files that get run. Um, the also.com uh, which automatically calls the uh, uh, the ECT uh, slash uh, asound.com, I believe, which is a system-wide configuration um, in a uh, in a protected directory, and then it calls the uh, the user space uh, asoundrc, which allows you to do custom configurations as well. So for any given user, because you're just interfacing with existing hardware devices in your own terminal session, it does give the user the ability to do what they want. So I created this file here. Um, it's got, it starts out with the definition for default device. Um, that would be the sound card that is used um, by default by most applications. Um, any audio software that is compatible with also, which is pretty much all of them, will have the um, either the ability to specify which also device is being used, or it will default to this one. Um, so it, there may be situations where you would have to configure this to point to the actual device that you want to use. Um, in this case right now, what I have done is I've created the default entry to be device one. Um, and I've used uh, the, the plug um, uh, plugin. Um, because it, it takes out that step of having to create a separate device uh, that can handle the full range of uh, sample frequencies and settings. So you can cascade these plugins as well, and you can have long definitions, which is really confusing. Um, so the first two things that are defined there are the PCM interface for default and the one for uh, uh, the, uh, control interface. Uh, it's just there, I don't know how to actually do anything with it. But then what I did was I created two specific ones. Um, DJ control and internal, which point to this device and the internal audio of the, uh, of the laptop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up Audacious, sorry, that doesn't sound good. And uh, this is pretty much the de facto player in a lot of the distributions. It doesn't have any of the elaborate features that some of them have. It just does what it's supposed to do. And in its configuration, uh, it, it can specify pulse audio, also OSS4, SDL, WildWriter, and Jack as its output uh, um, configurations. And in the settings tab, these are all of the devices that um, also knows about and or has had to find. It does create a bunch of them automatically. Um, so if you tell also to play a 5.1 surround, um, it has already got a configuration in it that will downmix that to the uh, audio device that uh, um, that uh, is attached to it. So this this entry right here will take up to six channels. Down makes them and do a two-channel stereo on that device. Um, 7.1, 5.1, 5.0, 4.1, 4.0, uh, 2.1. Um, 
it's also created uh, slightly more complicated ones down here for uh, um, I thought it was supposed to have some pretty uh, uh, DJ controller as well, but they don't seem to be that. Um, but what, I, what appears up here is uh, the default, which if I select it and start playing, what we have playing right now is audio through the default device, which is the DJ controller playing through the speaker that I have attached only to it. So uh, if that was what I wanted to do, if I wanted to listen to that speaker, then that would be um, that would be the goal but from the default. But what I can have with multiple sound outputs um, for multiple cards is speakers in different rooms or have one of the devices being a headset, which is uh, plugged into the computer. And if I want to uh, uh, just listen to music on the headset, um, there are a lot of USB heads headsets in there which have their own audio device that plugs into the USB port that provides a microphone and a, and a headphone connection. That one up here, in here I could assign it as a device and I could select um, the, uh, um, in here it would be an entry for it. But what I can do is I can, if I wanted to listen to the, uh, let's say the computer was attached directly to my TV, which would be attached via HDMI to my home theater system. If I wanted to listen to music on the home theater system, um, then I could specify the, uh, the other device. Uh, it would be the HDMI one if I had the HDMI here and was using it. But in this case, it's just the internal. And then this time when I hit play, Play through the uh, audio outputs of the laptop, which are connected to my mixer to the house sound system. So there are now two separate outputs. And in theory, although I haven't tried it, I could launch a separate program, like a video player. Um, So I played a video of this ridiculously stupid song um, through the uh, um, default audio device, which is this, at the same time that um, Audacious is playing music um, through the other audio device. Um, the potential for that um, would be if you were using a computer for um, a media center then you'd be able to uh, uh, um, uh, use the computer terminal um, to listen to a YouTube video through a headset while in the same room that's plugged into the TV. Um, if I can get that to launch. Um,
I'll just click that star on the XPMC interface. What does it do other than lock up? Um, there we go. Okay. The um, other configuration that I was working on, and unfortunately was not able to make it work, is creating a PCM device that would be both of them simultaneously. And this, from everything I can read, should have worked, and it doesn't. So what we have is a PCM defined with the name both. In theory, if you selected, instead of DJ control or internal, if you selected the both device, then the same audio stream would go through both devices. Um, if you wanted to have an extension cable out onto your patio at a party playing music, you can uh, just uh, have your home theater playing music and run an extension cable from the audio jack of the computer out to the patio and plug in some speakers out there and have it play the same audio. Um, so what it does is it defines a, a, type of, a type of route. There's a number of plugins that are defined by type. Um, there are plugins that, for the hardware, there are plugins, the plug plugins that uh, will do sample rate conversions. There is this plugin, which is, uh, allows you to, to route audio in non-standard ways. There are plugins that allow you to provide uh, um, uh, game control, um, adapt, adapt the game control either linearly or um, other methods for maximizing volume. You can install plugins that actually will process all of the audio coming out of the computer with a special effect plugin. Um, all of this seamlessly to the actual software that the end user is running. It's actually something that's programmed right into the, uh, the sound system itself. Um, but this is a plugin of type multi, uh, which has two slave devices. Um, the internal one and the DJ control. Um, the internal one has two channels. The, uh, the slave device has four channels. The, uh, uh, the reason this has four channels is it's got two channels for stereo mix to play up to the people who are to your audience. And it has two more channels which you plug headphones into which allows you to pre-cue the music in your ear without um, having to listen to the same thing that the audience does. Um, uh, and then the bindings, um, a little bit complicated the way it spells it out, but it's binding the first channel of the new device, which is zero, to the first, to the internal sound card. Then it, uh, using the same designation, it's taking that first channel and binding it to the first channel of the first device. Um, then the second channel is attached to the, um, uh, first device, the second channel is attached to the second channel of the, second, of the first device. And then the third channel is attached to the second device. The um, second channel is attached to the first channel of the second device. Um, it's really, really confusing. Um, and then there's a section here. Um, that allows you to do routing of the channels as well. Um, the only key to this here is uh, uh, there's, there's three numbers there. In this particular case, all of the, the last number in all the options is one, meaning that the full volume of that channel is going to be mapped under that channel. What they use this for is if you were down mixing from surround sound and you needed to eliminate the center channel, but there might be sounds on there that aren't anywhere else, you can actually map the center channel of the source material 50% in the left channel and 50% in the right channel. Or if it, that turned out to be too loud, you can put like 25% of the center channel in the left and 25% in the right. And you can take the rear channels and put them in the main mix at like 15%. And you can actually play around with how the different sounds coming from the surround sound speakers get mapped into just having two. Um, in this particular case, I just was doing full volume for all of them. And this doesn't work, and I don't know why. I'm not going to fight with it anymore. Um, so that's also configuration. Um, very complicated. Um, absolutely no user interface whatsoever. Um, and what I've done for this presentation so far, and I'm hoping this isn't going to complicate things, um, is I killed the Pulse Audio server. I told the configuration file to not automatically respawn it when it dies. Um, and then I told it to die. 
Um, so it is completely out of the way here. Um, the, the next thing that I'm going to demonstrate is the configuration tools for Pulse Audio. Uh, as I went through in my last presentation, but I'll review quickly, Pulse Audio is a sound server. It is basically an interface between the hardware level, which is implemented by ALSA, and the applications. The confusing part is that ALSA is also one of those things. Um, it also extends down into the driver level, but there is also basically also represents a sound server, um, which is the interface between the hardware and the, uh, and the uh, user applications. Uh, Pulse Audio is another option for that. It, it will uh, stream its audio outputs directly to hardware devices at the driver level. Um, but it has its own uh, um, software interface and, uh, and its own uh, configuration utilities. So hopefully what I can do here um, is Video drivers in the 
system that the login prompt is not compatible with the second one ever being attached. It is annoying. Um, so while this is reloading, because I've got a pulse audio. So yes, it, uh, it provides an interface for applications. Um, it provides, it, it defines all audio um, devices as either sources or sinks. Um, some of them are virtual, some of them are network based, but everything that Pulse Audio cares about is either a source of an audio stream or a sync, something that consumes it and does something with it. And I'm not sure if it pop up a second. Um, so each one of the sound cards in the um, uh, in the configuration will actually have an entry um, for their uh, for their audio stream. It will be a, a source for every input. Um, yep, this computer has lots of problems. Fortunately, it's the only laptop I have these days. Um, so the um, uh, so the sound card will be a sync. A source will be the application that's playing the audio. Um, it does provide an interface that allows you to connect sources and syncs in pretty much arbitrary ways. Um, the other thing it can do is it can present its. Uh, it can actually allow its own sound card, its own sound syncs to be. Uh, accessible from the network, so that some other computer running pulse audio can specify.
start also installation uh, with Pulse Audio. So I'm going to launch the Audacious Player again. And I'm going to put that on my screen here to get out of the way and start playing. And oh, it's on a drive which I need to. There we go. No, that's not. So I am currently playing a single screen through the internal sound card of the computer. Which, if you switch to playback, it actually creates an entry in this interface for audacious as a source. It actually sees it as a thing, which is producing the stream of audio. And it provides me with this option here to decide where I want it to go. I can switch it to another room in the house or to a different sound system. Um, and uh, that's uh, handy for individual things. If I, I can also perform the um, I launched another um, uh, uh, sound producing application, uh, video playback screen. They decided to play it on that one. Um, so, this song really is stupid. So, both of them are playing on different audio devices. Now, my goal for the also configuration was to have some way of playing into multiple devices at the same time. Um, there are a number of other applications that come with Pulse Audio which are considered depreciated. However, they're actually quite useful. Um, the, um, uh, the Pulse Audio Manager here, um, allows you to disconnect from the server, get some statistics and information about it. Um, uh, it shows uh, uh, some uh, information about what's currently loaded, what's currently active. Um, modules that are currently loaded. Um, Pulse Audio does use a bunch of modules as well. Also modules. Um, uh, so right here are the Bluetooth modules. Um, so that if the if a, a Bluetooth device that handled audio was attached to the computer, it would be able to address it as well. That would not actually it would not create an also device for a Bluetooth speaker, but that would go directly to the pulse audio layer. Um, both input and output. So if you had a headset um, that you could attach and you could use that for voice, um, in theory it would have a, a fast enough response time that I could use it through the computer through the mixer. Uh, to the sound system as the microphone for me addressing me now. Um, I did want to actually do that again this time, but I just don't have one of those devices. Um, but it would be probably the cheapest way for KW Love to have uh, a wireless microphone for its presenters. It would be a Bluetooth dongle for a phone attached to a computer. Um, so someday I will try it if it works, and I think we'll probably use it in the future. Um, and, uh, um, anything else with it? So, not a lot of internal stuff. Most of these you would never manually load. It has two cards for the, um, um, uh, for the two sound cards that are configured in the system. And, um, the other configuration tool here, there is a, um, uh, which you can't see on that screen, which is on this one, is a, uh, uh a system doc app that would provide access to all these. Um, and uh, what well, I'm gonna have to describe this because I, I it would not be tr trivial for me to get this display onto that screen. But uh, the first three options are you can specify uh, out of all of the uh, sources and sinks that it sees, um, uh, you can tell it where you want to. Uh, um, uh, I said the audio, and one of the things that I wanted to do until my found out that my other computer with uh, eBudget Studio isn't booting right now. Also, I would not have been able to bring another thing with me on the bus. Um, was to have a, another computer running with a Pulse server and have it actually send the stream to another system, which has been configured to receive audio streams and play them out on my other sound cards. 
Um, so what you can do is you can have multiple computers in your house um, and have the audio stream available on your network and you can have any room in the house say, I want to listen to the music that's playing on the patio. I can just dial it up. Um, it does require a lot of bandwidth if you use it too much um, because they a uncompressed audio stream for every pair of connections. So if, uh, if uh, um, this computer wanted to communicate audio with this one, and this one wanted to communicate with this one, and this one was being listened to by all of these computers in the office, your network was basically going to scream to a halt um, because there's way too much data being sent there. Um, but it, uh, it does uh, use the multicast configuration. But the other, uh, I can see what it is. There we go. Pulse out of device choosers is one of the most appreciated ones. Um, uh, oh, and yeah, this is the uh, interface for the. Uh, um, that message that popped up when I started was um, a message saying that it found a newly discovered uh, source or sync for Pulse Audio, which unfortunately wasn't that interesting because it's just the ones that were made available on this laptop. But in one of those configuration files, give me a second to find it. Um, it is. Oh, yeah, there's another application for launch. Um, uh, PA Preps. This is it. So, uh, make discoverable pulse audio network sound devices available local. So if any computer on your network has decided to publish an audio stream, um, you will be able to access it from this computer. It also has built-in functionality for Apple AirTunes, which I've never actually tried. Um, uh, this is the opposite road, uh, uh, making your local audio devices available to the network. Um, I'm currently configured that way. If anybody wanted to uh, configure their pulse audio um, to play something through a network accessible uh, stream, you should be able to just play it. Um, I do have it configured for not recording authentication. Uh, pulse audio authentication is, right now, I believe the only way that it does it is the system generates a cookie which you would manually transfer to any computer that you want. Um, to be able to access your stream. Um, I've not actually played with it, but that's, uh, apparently there's some system that's worked out that will um, allow auto-downloading of, uh, of the cookie, but uh, that's how it does it. Um, uh, the, um, this is basically a very simple uh, uh, um, network uh, or uh, intercom type stuff. Um, multicast uh, receivers and senders, a uh, very simple way to um, um, uh, uh, yep. um, I can basically say that the audio that's going into this microphone is sent to the entire network. Um, uh, or vice versa, to actually look for any stream that's presented this way. And this option right here, which does everything that I was trying to do with also. Enable multiple outputs. So what we have now is um, in output devices. There's supposed to be a. Oh. Is it on there? I just can't see it. Yep. I, unfortunately, the. Um, the protector is too low for resolution. Oh, maybe I can this. I So we'll take this up to the two audio devices. So.
And also something that I um, struggled with for a day and a half trying to make work is an option in Pulse Audio. Unfortunately, that option wasn't actually available in any of the configuration tools that are installed by default, which made it a little harder to find. Uh, the, the, the PA Press app is not part of the standard installation. You do have to uh, install it from the repository. Um, and it provides the, uh, um, the uh, network configuration um, and uh, another thing that's great out here, um, uh, I might be able to demonstrate this in the second half. Um, it's a function of the media centers in general. Um, it is uh, the ability to publish um, a essentially a SIG for audio. Um, when uh, I installed some software on my uh, on my tablet. It told it to play a file, and it said, what do you want to do? Do you want to play it with this player? Do you want to play it with this player? Or do you want to send it across the network and play it on this device? And uh, I can demonstrate that with my phone if I can get the uh, um, XPMC to work properly, and I'll do that in the second half. Um, but this, that is uh, some function that, uh, um, and it also works with video as well. You can uh, be browsing on web, uh, YouTube on uh, my tablet, and when you click on a YouTube link, it says, do you want to play it in the browser, do you want to play it in the YouTube app, or do you want to send it to your media center? You click send it on your media center, and your media center plays the YouTube video. Um, it's uh, something that is supposedly been implemented for Pulse Audio directly. So when you walk into your house, um, when you listen to music, you can just tell your phone to play the music you're listening to on your home system, as opposed to uh, uh, your headphones. Um, and uh, uh, so if I go to a friend's place and I have a song on my phone and I want them to hear, I could just tell their TV to play it. Um, it's kind of a neat system. Um, uh, and it, there is a, a, a false audio implementation that does it directly. We'll have to run some sort of intermediary media center. Um, I did find packages um, that apparently are this. And I was kind of surprised to see the uh, the options and the preferences here because it does seem like not supported package. Um, but it, again, it's something that's probably new and not part of the standard distribution. Um, so this is the halfway point, and that's basically all I'm going to cover is some practical non-standard configurations for audio. The other half of the presentation that I had prepared for last time that I will continue with this time is some actual tasks that people might want to do with audio. Um, and some kind of neat stuff too. Uh, so I'll spend some time reconfiguring my hardware. Um, I am a little bit limited by the 800 by 600 display here, um, but uh, let's see what we can do. So I'm going to take a break, and I'll get set up, and we'll do some cool stuff.